Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Vinny Kemmler. Vinny is the Director of Hardware at Mobile AI. Vinny, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks for having me back. Uh, third time, huh? Third time's the charm? Yeah, no, nah, I mean, I uh, appreciate you coming back in. This is one yeah, of those yeah. fun things where, I mean, you and I met on the show. Well, I guess we did like one vetting call, but it was like an introduction and those can go either way. So I feel like about half the time, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's probably not a good fit. But with you, I was like, this is a kindred spirit. I'm really glad to know this guy. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was actually looking back at my calendar just this morning to try to, sometimes I, I like to just copy paste calendar events like dentist and certain doctor appointments. It's just, just easier than typing it all in. Makes sense. And I was looking for my last dental appointment and I came across our original June podcast recording that I had blocked in my calendar. And I'm like, oh man, that was June. I was like, wow, that was, so that's like eight months ago, probably seven months ago. Yeah. And yeah. The phone call was probably like eight months or so ago. And so it's kind of cool that you have me back three times. I hope your, uh, your audience won't get sick of me. Yeah, I don't think so. Your episodes are actually pretty popular, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, nobody watches this. but it's... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I push it a little bit on my socials. I mean, I, I don't have a big social presence, but I think, um, I think some of my, some of my friends, when I do post or, or, you know, kind of appreciate, oh, something new to go check out, see something, you know, so yeah. I don't post much on Facebook or, or, and I don't have, you know, Twitter and, and Instagram and all that stuff. So it's really just, just Facebook. Nice. But then I have, you know, some family members and friends that are kind of like, that I've known for a long, long time that I think go check it out. And really, it's just my out. mom triple clicking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to get my family to, to actually watch it. They're like, I can't commit two hours to watching you. I already spent 30 some money, 40 My years aunt likes it, but my dad, like, will not watch it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> he's like, he's probably like, when you get the Joe Rogan money, I'll watch it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to, to get a gift. But, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Certainly well, I think you know, what enough. you're doing is, um, I remember we talked before you started recording on the second one about how much work you put into this. And I'm impressed by Thank you. your commitment to doing this time and time again every week multiple times a week that on your end and then the, the staff that you that's really means well. a lot to me yeah no, i wouldn't be able to do it without them i mean uh it, it's a small group it's it's carl on the editing alicia on the graphics and then um we had a social media coordinator for a bit but i'm doing that job now because we're uh it's a vacant role <laughs> so, and then i'm a, I'm a double director as well so it's, it's a busy day for sure yeah i i bet a lot of your you know consistent regulars probably don't realize what it takes to, to put this together. So I, I applaud you for continuing to do this despite COVID, despite, I'm sure you get a lot of reschedules and people that are busy and, and sick and whatnot. Absolutely. No, it's, it's funny you say that because the last two weeks I had to scramble last minute just to not miss an episode. And I mean, and I have kids or a whole lot going on. So for me, I am a professional in this going on, but for me, it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like one of the few things that I, I just have regularity on. So like, you know, I'm always going to publish an episode every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, uh, 6 a.m. Pacific. And so I, um, that's pretty cool. And I hope yeah. that one day it pays off big and, uh, you know, yeah, who knows what happens. I mean, it already sort of has, like, even if I don't make a dime on this, I mean, I have so much fun making these and talking to people like you and I don't know. I mean, it, it honestly, it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to say guaranteed intellectual conversation, but like a boosted probability of having an intellectual conversation where you yeah. sort of, I don't know, I mean, you feel like you're you're doing something for the career. So it's like, oh, great, making, making a piece well, and, of content. And I think you've been around the block long enough in our industry to know that, you know, when I was young, I didn't really appreciate the value of networking. Same. And, and like when I was first, you know, working in New York and, and this, you know, now like their microchip now, like that company, there would be like conferences and events and things. And I was like, I don't want to go to those things. And then when I first started working at Qualcomm, even then I was like, eh, I don't really want to get involved in these kind of like, I just want to, you know, go to work, go to the gym, you know, go, I was in my twenties, thirties, you know, I was like, I just want to go party downtown, whatever. Yeah, for sure. Been there, done that. And then now what's really interesting is our CEO chat of, of Model AI. I had a really good conversation with him just the other nice. day where we were talking about one particular contract work that we're doing on that we're probably not making money on. We're actually, in fact, probably losing money uh, just due to spin and churn and how many people, you know, we, we were pulling in on this. Yeah. I mean, not not significant, but just enough where it's like, okay, it's not going to be one of those. Black it's like a loss things. leader. Yeah. But he's like, you know, this is one of those things where it's, 
it just adds to that network and aspect of what we do. And as long as, you know, we maintain high level of, of customer satisfaction and high level of skill and output, uh, you never know where these customers of ours may end up in the future. Oh, for sure. And, and, and they're just going to remember, you know, that level of great support and commitment and, and uh, just work output from, from us. You know, it's not always about the money. And what's interesting is he made a comment about how probably more than half uh, I mean, we're a small company, so you know we're talking about half customers. But you know, you know, a few dozen or so here and there is, is a lot of customers for us. That if you can get like you know six, ten, twelve, twenty, thirty customers or or, or interest from just networking people you know, oh, conferences, for sure. things of that nature, you can really spur some big things happening. And, yeah, and it's really kind of interesting how like I think it makes me realize, oh wow, all that networking because Chad is a good networker. He's been doing it for twenty plus years. Awesome. He made a comment about how so many of our customers were previous network networking situation that he's has done in the past. One of our big customers was someone that like interned with us at Qualcomm. That's awesome. Who, keep, who keeps in touch with their interns when they go away? <laughs> <laughs> but Chad does. Actually, and one of my just, favorite friends to just have a drink with is somebody I used to be an intern for, you know, like nine years ago. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's like it's like you never know who like who your intern's gonna turn into, or you know your interns can turn into a customer, or your eventual owner or someone that buys you out. You never know, right? <laughs> oh, for sure. And with any of those people, I mean, one of my best referral sources is our mutual friend who introduced us to each other. And I mean, he's referred in like you know six figure contracts to SKA. <laughs> oh, nice. Because yeah, you know, which I, I was never expecting any of that. I just you know, you talking about like, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I haven't talked. I got to sync back up with him. The last I even exchanged anything with him was the introduction email that he had with, with you and I, I don't know, back last April, almost April, May. He, so he came to me with kind of a funny request him. yesterday. <laughs> I won't What's get into that? the details. I'll, I'll tell you after the thing, <laughs> but I, I think you'll get a laugh out of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I owe him a quick email and say, what's up, see how he's doing. I haven't checked in with him in a while. Um, but that's it. It, it is, it is crazy how that all works out. I think, yeah, I took that for granted when I was younger, and then I'm glad that my CEO hasn't and, and is able enabling our success now as a small company. And yeah, so, not everybody does that. I mean, I, I think um, it's good when you work with someone who who understands, you know, the value of not burning bridges. Like, I mean, Lord knows yeah. I didn't know that, you know, early in my career. I um, could have enjoyed burning a bridge, which I'm not proud of today, but I'm proud that I learned from it. You know, I don't do that yeah. anymore. But, you know, there was a time, like, especially when I was just getting out of school, where just like, you know, I just could not wait to burn that bridge. So, <laughs> it took yeah, a long I, time I to recover there, from. <laughs> so. there, there was one of my previous companies, I I'll, I'll, shall remain nameless, um, that I was so excited to write up my exit interview questionnaire to them. <laughs> and I pretty much gave it to them and said that there is no chance in hell I am coming back to here unless, like, you guys do all this stuff and just... And it's just, it's funny how, like, because I, I, I knew it was going to, like, their HR or their, like, you know, their retention team specialist, and it wasn't going to the people I worked with. <laughs> I cared about. <laughs> so I'm, I still keep in touch with some of those former colleagues, and I cared about them. They did nice. work. We had good relationships. That's what I wanted to maintain. And I knew this exit questionnaire was going to the people that, you know, you never meet, you never see, who just put this into some database, and they track it based on... <laughs> I'm like you know what they need to know how bad this company really is yeah they and probably I, did though if they worked there and you felt that way i think some people just get afraid to express their opinion i never oh was. for sure you know i've always been the strong you know everyone knew when i was in a meeting i spoke up you know <laughs> just no I'm, like, I'm like that too and I, <laughs> it's interesting that we can hold down these upper management jobs with <laughs> mentality but I think some it's probably value. appreciate that because there's yeah. truth in there. And and I think, you know, when you express your opinion, as long as you're not being condescending or cruel in nature, you know, you obviously don't want to be cruel or mean to someone in a, in a meeting, but as long as you express your opinion wholeheartedly, honestly, and, and like I, I try to express mine, if it is of a, you know, if I say this is my personal feeling, I, I try to make sure it's distinction from, you know, like a logical or objective fact. If something is a little more subjective, Smart. I try to make it clear that this is how I feel about it. But I think people appreciate that honesty and truth. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. actually. You can go a long way. I was talking to the CEO at Formlogic the other day, and he was talking about um, 
one of our machinists. So just give you a little background on the company since, um, you know, it's, it's a startup. Um, so we just raised $40 million in funding, uh, to that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's cool. Uh, so like 30 million or so plus or minus one, we'll say is a series a, and then the rest of it's machine tool financing. And so what we're doing is we're running a whole bunch of machine tools. So mills and lathes, mainly mills, um, the Doosan DVF 5000 is a Korean vertical machining center, five axis is like our workhorse. And um, we're, I think we have 33 machine tools at our new factory at my last count, which is a decent size operation. Our old one has four, we're folding down and moving to the new place. It, actually, no, 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 sorry. Um, four Doosan DVF 5000s plus two other machines is six. So we have one of those nine axis, you know, like the CNC, like, you know, hypnotic videos where you see it like making some crazy complicated like door handles, <laughs> but, um, like so, all that millions of dollars of technology. Yeah, you exactly. You go to Home Depot to buy for three ninety nine. <laughs> I think it's like a three quarter million dollar machine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, but it's, I don't it's, think there's it definitely more than that. Is, you know. Yeah. So we're, we're working on kind of novel software to, to add some intelligence to these things to get better accuracy and then to run them with less people. Cause as you know, like the labor shortage has made it really tough to man, yeah. you know, machine shops and, um, that sort of thing. So I don't know, it's, it's like the, the aim is to kind of make it so people can remote in easier and also, so you don't need as many people to do more stuff and then to make machine shops more scalable. So I don't know. It's it's kind of fun working at, at it's not a shop. I'm, our our CEO is like this is not a machine shop. It's uh it's sort of a project on you know figuring out a better way to run machine shops. So so what's your what's your specific role in it? Because I know you, you kind of have a robotics you know kind of embedded experience. I'm I'm curious what's your role. Yeah. So my official title is director of advanced projects, and what that means I think I'm still figuring it out myself because I'm only there three months is that I'm in charge of research and development projects. And so cool. it's cool. If, you know, you, you can kind of turn your own title into an acronym equivalent to DARPA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I need an A at the end. That'd be DAPA. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's yeah, it's, pretty neat. So three months, three months you've been there. Yeah. And it, it's kind of interesting because I, I turned down another job where uh, I would have been walking into like a 29 person team my first day. And um, just, I was interviewing at this company, which I'm not going to name. And I, um, but a bigger company, um, like really, really big multinational owned it. Um, and I just didn't feel like the best to me, if that makes sense. Like oh, I just yeah. didn't, didn't love the culture. And so I, I was, you know, sort of having cold feet and, I um, started to think, you know, well, the money seems good. I mean, I, I like the idea of going into a larger company and, you know, seeing what I can do with that kind of financing on, on you know, getting some really cool projects executed, because um, that's what I've been doing anyway. Um, like, it seems like fun. Maybe I'll ask this other company I've been trying to get as an SKA client, Formlogic, if they want to counter this offer. And they said yes. <laughs> and here I am. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. So I got so I got to ask you a quick question. This is we're actually um, my team. We're gonna be looking for uh, you know a new kind of junior level hardware engineer, or someone out of college. Cool. Um, I'm kind of curious. This is gonna be my first time actually conducting interviews with someone since COVID started. And so I'm curious on your end, as someone who's been on that side of the table, how has it been doing interviews? during COVID, like, cause I mean, I, I hearken back to like, when you can go out to lunch with somebody, you can just kind of, it's just easy to kind of take them wherever you want, wherever you want, introduce them to people. Yeah. Like to now, even just, we had some new intern start uh, a couple weeks ago and I, I met him the, for the first time yesterday and I know I'm going to forget him because I don't see his face, right? It's like, this is all you see. And it's like, yeah, you think about like, it's gotta be tough being the interviewee, being on that side of it. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, do you interview in person or are you doing interview, it remotely? I would imagine is like you can show your facial expression, which shows your interest. Yeah, I completely and agree. Excitement and motivation. And if like, you're blocked, like, like, so tell me, like, what did you feel going through interviews during COVID? So a few things. So I, I think every interview I've done since COVID has been remote. So nobody's wearing a mask because they're on the other side of a camera. Okay, that makes sense. So I, I can sort of see their, like I did... 
three, four interviews today. Um, cause I'm trying to get some chemical engineers for a, um, we're setting up like a mini anodization line to test some hypotheses of mine. And so I, I've, that was pretty fun because I mean, it's, it's sort of a new field for me. Um, yeah. and so that it was kind of a cool, you know, dig through the network and this person knows that person. Okay. Can I ask them? And, oh, who do they know? You know, and I, I was looking at companies that, so like Arconic Alcoa laid off a bunch of people a couple of years ago. And so I was kind of looking in there, you know, recent retirees pile. And then, um, Pittsburgh plate glass also has like a lot of, uh, people. So we'll, we'll see who they got. And, it's kind of been interesting to to sort of take it from that angle. I guess in person with the mask, you're sort of right. You do lose a range of facial expression, but you can sort of see it in the eyes. I mean, maybe not as much, but I'm like trying to, I'm trying to visualize it because yeah. Like, did you feel like you were cheated or robbed of any experience, both being on, on either side of the table? Oh, for, I mean, I try not to make myself a victim too much, but at the same time, I guess I feel like, I mean, I miss, you know, I was missing, I definitely got stir crazy. I mean, I'm a very extroverted dude. And so I, I didn't really like having to, you know, isolate and, and not be around people. And I mean, that wasn't, but one thing that was nice about it and, you know, was I, um, I noticed that like, it didn't really matter where your friends were when everybody was isolating. So like, what I mean by that is I have a really, really good friend who's actually been on the podcast. Uh, his name is Ariel Eisen and he, um, just started a uh, little teeny machine operation to make bicycle buckles. He bought a hundred thousand dollar brother Speedio, and uh, with money he made um, doing some stuff. I don't want to put him on blast, but you know, it's cool business actually. He, but I, I don't want to reveal what he's up to um, and you know blow up his his business plan. Of but um, you can anyone can look up what that machine is worth. <laughs> so basically, he and he's got it all over Instagram, and so. Um, he's got that machine set up and, you know, we've got all these $300,000 to, you know, three quarter of a million dollar machines running, but the way he automated his as like one dude in a barn is so clever. And I mean, he took these PVC pieces and he milled out bits. Um, do you know, do you know anything about CNC machining? Do you know what a tombstone is? I don't know what a tombstone is. No, so I'm not, tombstones, I'm not a CNC expert. No, so I'm not. I'm learn. I'm becoming one, but I, I wasn't one up until several months ago. <laughs> and so um, a tombstone is like a big aluminum brick, um, and it probably doesn't have to be aluminum, but all the ones I've seen so far are aluminum. And it's you basically hold it on uh, a spinny axis on your mill, um, and then you can expose different pieces mounted to the outside of this aluminum, we'll call it a cylinder, but it's really more of like a hexagonal prism. And each face of the hexagon can have um, like a couple of parts mounted to it. And so you turn it this way and you mill out these parts. Now you turn it this way and you mill out those parts. Now you turn it another bit and you mill out okay. those parts. And so it's a way to get like eight parts instead of one on at a time. And so- oh, So your setup time is you can, you can get a lot more steps of the setup time introduced together. Yeah. And for those gets, instead of repeated in out, in out, in out steps, you can just load up a whole bunch of different, even different projects, I assume. Yeah. They don't have to build the same thing. You could do that. So um, you can, but typically with a tombstone, it's the same thing. Uh, I don't, I don't know what that is, but I've always instances seen. Instances of the multiple yeah. instances of it. But then there's, there's another thing called palletizing where you can, you can take uh, something called a zero point system, which pulls in a pallet. So it's like a chunk of aluminum with a part on it. And you can use that. I've seen that used for more heterogeneous loads. It's like different parts. Um, and then the pallets can have QR codes to let you know what, what bit is on there or like an RFID. And then your machine is like, okay, I've got, you know, this part. Now I'm going to work on that and load this program. So there's, there's That's some cool. pretty cool stuff you can do, but anyway, so my buddy was using tombstones and then he went to, um, so I guess this is like a Toyota um, philosophy, and I might get some of this wrong, so I apologize in advance to anyone who knows better. Please let me know. But um, you can, uh, I guess with that, like if, if you have your fixturing fucked up ever so slightly, so if you've got like a bolt loose on your tombstone, or if you have um, an axis misaligned, or you've got just something out of place, you can mess up all eight parts. Or maybe you mess up the last four, but you don't know where you're, 
error occurred if something jars or yeah, you know any number of things go wrong so i mean you're you have to throw out a bunch of stuff and, and the setup is worse um okay go back a step the advantage of the tombstone overloading one piece in is now while it's running those eight different machining operations you can go and send an email or work on another project or you know paint some other stuff over here and it just gives you more time without having to load the machine and because you know like every time you interrupt an engineer it's you know, five minutes to interrupt them and get them off their task, another five minutes to give them their new task, and then another five for them to reacquire the task. So you're you're taking away 15 minutes of their time. So um, it's kind of like that mentality. So if you don't have to keep stopping, gotcha. you can accomplish more. So, That's pretty neat. That's yeah, pretty I thought cool. it was cool. So now instead of a tombstone, what my buddy's using is he's ripped that out, and he's got 40 chunks of aluminum on this tray, basically. And that tray is mounted on um, the zero, one of those zero point systems. So the zero point goes in, holds the tray. The tray has got all 40 of these pieces on it. And there's a little robotic hand that goes in and grabs one, puts in the vise. It does all the machining on that one. The robotic hand grabs it again, dumps it in a bin, and then grabs the next one off the, off the table. So you can do 40 at a time now. He doesn't have cool. to bolt them into a tombstone because they just sit in this little PVC. It's super cool. So he was showing me that. And I just... For for a dude to do that in the barn, I was like, that is so clever. And I, I sent a video to yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah, Formologic Slack. I'm like, hey guys, check this out. <laughs> I mean, that reminds me a lot of um, you know, I'm a circuit board expert, I guess. You know, design and work a lot with the you know fabrication and assembly of, of those things. It reminds me a lot of like the circuit board assembly equipment. If you ever get to if you ever got to go to a, a an assembly house where you see them take the raw plain circuit board that's, you know, laminate and copper and, you know, has the green or blue or black, whatever color solder mask the company wants to do for that particular board. And they put it in the machine and they apply solder either through a screening or through a jet paste. Yeah. And then you go through a pick, what's called a pick and place machine. Oh, those things are so cool. It's just, it, it's, it, you've heard of a Gatling gun, right? The, the circular yeah. machine gun. Yeah. I've watched a bunch of videos of them. They're awesome. <laughs> And Forgotten so weapons, you would so it's think a great that one. The, this pick, these pick and place machines, to some ex respects, I think are kind of inspired by Gatling guns because they actually look and sound like Gatling guns with the nozzles. So when you want to go place like a resistor or a capacitor or, or, or an IC on a board, you know, they, they come off these reels and like, you know, tapes and reels or trays. And so this machine with these nozzles has to go um, pick them up. You know, they have to go go to where the reel is or the tray is, pick it up with vacuum and then bring it over to the PCB and place it on the PCB where it's with what they call the stencil or the solder paste landing cool. pattern is for that part. So now if you can imagine a PCB, you know, like one of these. Nice. Has, That's a beautiful one. Very dense. Literally, literally hundreds and hundreds of parts, you know, for, for these machines to go and pick up a part. Does that interface to a TS2 or is that something different? I mean, I don't know the part numbers or the model oh, numbers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but you, but you can imagine that the, uh, you know, if, you, if the machine had to go pick up one part and then traverse where the PCB was and put it down and then go pick up another part and then go put it down. Yeah. Extremely inefficient, right? Yeah. So they have these nozzle heads that look like Gatling guns that have literally like two dozen tubes. Oh, that's awesome. That it goes and it will like pick up a part, quick rotate, pick up the next part, quick rotate, pick up the next part, you know, and fill up its feeders and then go and then drop it on the PCB, you know, it'll, tra it'll traverse the X, Y distance. Yeah. And then, and again, in some kind of pattern order, drop them off in a particular pattern. And just every time it does it, it's just, it's just like, that's awesome. <laughs> it sounds like Gatling gun every time going off. And it kind of sounds not like seen same. those latest ones. That's so cool. It's just amazing how fast they operate. And it, it reminds me of that same concept that you just said your friend was doing how you're, instead of just doing the one, at a time or even you know six or eight you're trying to do 40 yeah to scale like the most common thing to reduce the most common time waste of time and in, in the case of you know putting components on a circuit board it's that travel time yeah that is minimize that travel time back and forth between where the parts are and where the parts need to be and so that's kind of the same concept is i think it sounds like in, in a lot of that cnc stuff the the wasted time is the operator loading and unloading the thing right so if you can minimize how often they need to do that this harkens back to that second podcast we had where i talked about elon musk's 
uh, strategies for you know, process refinement. Yeah, like like yeah. like making it fast, like getting rid of, of steps that, that aren't necessary, right? Until you, you know, break making it, making it faster, optimizing it. <laughs> so it kind of sounds like that's pretty neat. So that's pretty cool stuff. To yeah, I mean the new pick and plays machine sound awesome. I'm kind of sad I haven't seen one of those yet. <laughs> Feel, feel like a room. Yeah, if we ever get you, you know, if you ever, uh, you know, in, in San Diego, you know, one of these months, you know, as COVID clears up, I'll, I'll get you to come visit our That'd be nice. shop. Yeah, we actually build um, most, almost all of our PCBs we build in Carlsbad, uh, Southern California. Uh, it's a town just north of San Diego. Uh, it's still San Diego County. It's it's not LA um, or Orange rather, um, but it's 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 only like half hour from our you know corporate office. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, it'd be it's really fun to I, see that stuff and, 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 and I may actually take you up on that. Yeah, we actually, I think we actually have on our website, and I can send you a link afterwards. Sure. We actually have a video showing, um, we have a product called Flight Core. I only have part of it here. Um, it's a 32 bit MCU, kind of cool. It runs, you know, open source flight software. Wait, can I see that backside again? That's a lot of connectors. That's, well, I'm trying to just, yeah, this is, oh, that's awesome. A lot of, you have, G you have GPS, you have magnetometers, you can have uh, motor controls. Just the miniaturization on that, though, is insane. I mean, that's that's a lot of stuff and not a lot of real estate. Yeah, so we, we have um, one video showing the jet paster operating, putting down um, solder paste on where the components would go. And it's kind of cool just to see the same thing. It's like, burr, burr, and just to <laughs> imagine the, the number of cycles that these things go through. And so I think a lot of your work is parallels and, and there's a lot of, I think, overlap with. It sounds like it. The SMT, you know, PCB assembly aspects of just, you know, these machines just trying to optimize what they're doing. And I bet you those industries are watching each other closely. I mean, I, I was talking to a guy today and the, um, I don't know what the right word is, but like people that make like chips and he was doing optoelectronics and, um, and like chip fabrication and just the scale of that is insane. Like, like nanometer scale stuff, which. Oh yeah. It's a whole nother. I don't know how the hell you hit those tolerances. I mean, it was, it was pretty incredible just to hear him talk. I mean, everything's done with lasers. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> in, in, a, in a clean room with lasers and lots of checking, lots of checking, lots of checking. And a high scrap rate, it seems. Yeah. And that's one of those things where you mentioned where if you get to a certain point in the process and you start failing, you don't know when you fail. So you got to scrap the whole lot. That makes a lot of sense. If you have a silicon wafer and you end up, you can get a drift. If you get some drift towards the edge, you end up ruining the whole wafer. Do people use more. single piece flow in that industry, I wonder? Where you just make a whole one and then you go to the next whole one and then you go to the next whole one so you don't have like an error mess up step 32 of every recipe? I think they've got it down similar to circuit boards where you do, in a circuit board, you create what's called a panel. Yeah. Where maybe Where maybe you have like, you know, um, you know, six or eight or 12 of these in a panel. And so if you mess up on the one panel, you know, you only lose that one panel. That's not so bad. Uh, That's a good compromise, then, I think. You know, you probably, if you're making, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them or dozens of panels, you just got to pay, you know, just each panel gives you an opportunity to recheck and recalibrate. And so I think with silicon, it's a wafer, right? The, the, I don't know if you ever seen those wafers. And, and I know I back know in the day, look when I was at SMSC now microchip wafers were only maybe, you know, five, six, seven, eight inches, inches. And so you'd maybe get like a few hundred dies on a wafer. Now I think wafers have gone to like 12 inches or more. Oh, cool. And so if you think about like a little MCU, that's, you know, just a few millimeters by a few millimeters, think about how many <laughs> thousands you can that's get awesome. on a single wafer. And then if you destroy the whole wafer, <laughs> That's expensive. <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think there's, I think I bet you there's they have dozens of process engineers whose sole job it is to track that and you know manage you know their potential fallout and scrap and yield yeah. so that they don't lose too much money. But I would imagine there's quite a bit of that. Yeah, that's all. We're we're implementing a quality management system now. Um, just given what we're trying to do, and I'm gonna try to get our director of quality on the show. Um, you know, in a few months here, but, um, she was telling me, you know, if you have something like a, a miscalibrated, uh, micrometer, you can go back and figure out which jobs that micrometer was used on and yank all those parts, you know, That's I mean, we cool. check them on a CNMM anyway, but you could, you could track the root cause and then find associated faults. Like it's, 
that's pretty neat. So I'm sure they're doing something like that. To... Yeah, definitely. And, you know, especially in today's, oh, by the way, one thing we never forgot to do is cheers, by the way. Oh, yeah. So okay. oh, yeah. Earlier you had um, open my whistle pig here. You had a bottle earlier before that you started the recording and I've had my glass put aside. I'm, so I'm doing an early 4.30 happy hour. Cheers, Vinny. Yeah, what are you drinking? Uh, today I'm going b low budget, Jack Daniels. Nice. Only but good for me, I like it. You know, it's, it's, when I was a kid, my dad always drank it and I just, I acquired the taste for it. I like it. I appreciate it. It's not bad. I really like the green label, the rye they got. I've been, I've been getting that a lot lately. Mm. I think I have a bottle I mean, over to me, it just it's that classic flavor that no one's been able to replicate, and I like I like it a lot. I don't water it down. You know, I just drink it neat. That's why I like I like my whiskey. I, I it's that. funny when I was in my uh, my twenties and I'd go like the bars and whatnot. And I would talk to my dad about it. He'd be like, "What do you get to drink?" I'd be like, "I don't know, beers or you know, martinis or Jack and Coke." He'd be like, "What?" <laughs> He'd be like, "Don't put any of that caca and Jack." <laughs> <laughs> He's, That's uh, awesome. <laughs> actually just a quick on aside. Yeah. So he made my wife and I a set of, uh, he likes to do like woodworking. He's got oh, he cool. built this nice shop for himself in Montana. It's probably like 1200. No, more than that. I think it's like 2000 square feet. That's a big does, like woodworking craft, stuff like that. And so he built my wife and I for our, our wedding, um, back in 2018, he built us a set of Adirondack chairs. He likes to build Adirondack chairs. And with our moving to Texas and back and then COVID and everything, it's, he, we never got them until just this past summer when he drove he drove down from Montana to bring us our Adirondacks as, as our wedding gift almost three years late. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him that Vanessa, my wife, I'm like, yeah, she wants to paint them. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, are you going to graffiti my work? <laughs> That's awesome. You know? He's just so old school. He just likes to keep things pure and clean and neat. He likes just the wood tone. You know, he's like, he's like, did he, he like, take the time wanna, to stain you know, it? Uh, seal it and and lacquer it. That's fine. But you want to paint it? He's like, oh, he, he's he like, didn't even stain it. He's getting mad at you for painting it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I don't even want to know about it. He's like, next time I come, if they're painted, hide them. <laughs> <laughs> That's little, hilarious. Uh, a little old school. A little, little, uh, anyway. Yeah. Now, my, my granddad would buy everything in cash, which is like a total old school move. Yeah. Yeah, that my dad. Yeah, I, I always carry cash in my wallet because of him. Yeah, and, same. Actually, my dad got me into it. You know, don't leave the house without like at least a hundred bucks in cash. You never know. And tell um, it to the guy that mugged me. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that story. Um, All good. <laughs> yeah. So what we're, we're we're we were talking about uh, the crossover between. So you were talking. I was talking about machining. I mentioned my buddy's thirty taper machine, which we're running so much bigger machines than that. Uh, you mentioned pick and place. Oh, another cool thing about these little machines that I love, just to not to talk myself out of the job too much, but <laughs> they're they're great because because they're so small. So a thirty, it, it has like a tapered thing that your tool fits in. So similar to actually to to get even more uh, similarities with it. So you mentioned that you can grab like you know a whole bunch of parts on that like Gatling gun esque mechanism with a new modern pick and place. With a CNC machine, there's a tool changer in it a lot of time. And so you can hold, in, in my one buddy's, it's 21. I think ours uh, are Doosan's. I might get the number wrong, but it's around 45. And um, 30 taper tools are like that big around. Um, 40 taper tools that we use are like that big. And then we get some 50 tapers, which I actually haven't seen in person yet. <laughs> at that location a whole lot. And then there's these HSK 100s that are even bigger. So they get they get pretty tremendous. And um, I, there's a whole strategy for deploying those that I can get into later if you want to get bored to tears. But um, my um, the 30 taper is great because for a lot of machines to change tools and forgive me if I get the numbers wrong, it, it can be like quite a while because you got to spin down a thing going like 17,000 RPMs and it's got a lot of inertia. And so, you know, it, it I don't know, I want to say like, like 10 to 20 seconds, but I think the 30 taper changes in 1.3. So, and it might be under 10. I might, I might be over exaggerating. I, I haven't timed our tool changes because accuracy is more important to us than, uh, than speed and form logic. But because my buddy's making belt buckles where they don't have to be 
or sorry, uh, bike packing buckles, but they don't have to be precise, but you want to make them really, really fast to maximize your margins. He cares about speed. And so right, it's yeah. just like, zoom, zoom, zoom. And so these machines were actually developed uh, by Brother uh, for making like their printers and parts for those. And then they're used to make iPhones, I believe. They're a Brother customer. And so it's it's a drilling machine. It's it's meant for just like drilling tons of holes in a little part really, 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 really quickly. Uh, the bigger, biggest competitor is Fanuc. But with those little machines, it's cool because you can just, it's like 30% faster than our machines because there's so little inertia on the platform. So probably yeah. we take less than 10 seconds with the 30% difference. <laughs> it's, it's pretty neat to see what the you know modern robotics and machinery um, does. And it's funny that one of my favorite quotes I love um, from Donald Hudson, our CTO, who's, you know, BattleBots guy. I got to get him to get on your show one of these days. He's oh, that'd be awesome. So, Please. He's just always so freaking busy. Yeah, it makes sense as to of, me. As of this recording date, they only had the one fight on BattleBots last week. Which I'm sure by the time this airs, it won't be a spoiler that, that they lost that one. And so I always like it's oh, fun to talk to him about his. He's good about like. Well, it's coming out this about. Sunday, so let me know. Yeah, they um um, him and his team because his one of his other teammates, Reg, works with us at Modal AI as well. They're so good about having the poker face of like not not giving anyone any tell as to how they did because this was actually in August when they oh. the competition. Yeah, those guys so are they, serious they, about they that. Were, they were, yeah, they were doing this taping in August, and here we are now, January, and it's finally airing. And they are impressive at like not giving any tells as to how they did. And we just got to watch the show and wait. And see, uh, <laughs> like everyone else, that's all. Um, but anyway, when when we were back at Qualcomm, one of the, I love one of his comments that he made that sticks with me to this day, that, where I showed him the SMT pick and place machine. Yeah. When we were doing when we were building one of our designs and he's a mechanical engineer he works with all like SolidWorks and all this CAD tools he's you know he's a CNC expert I would say he's a CNC expert compared to me obviously I know nothing he knows a lot of these things and he was like that's the coolest thing he's like I'm watching robots build robots that's awesome <laughs> and I think in a lot of ways it's like that's actually really pretty neat and it's kind of it's kind of like iRobot scary in a way like that movie iRobot with uh, Will Smith back from the uh, early 2000s. Yeah, it was, I love that movie. It is kind of scary to think about, you know, we're building robots with other robots, and it's like... Not all the way yet, though. I think that's 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 the defining difference, is that they can't fully assemble yet. We'll get of course, there. yeah, it's just, it's just funny. <laughs> I just like that quote, though. When I, whenever I see robotics things at work, building circuit boards, or, you know, now you're CNC stuff that you have going on. We're making just mainly like, bits for satellites, of, moon rover. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. It's just I like see. It's amazing to see the level of automation and control we can we can achieve. No, I completely agree. It's it's so neat. I mean, how rapidly the tech advances too in all these fields is incredible. Because, I mean, I'm pretty sure CNC tools really haven't been a thing for that long. Maybe the '70s and then '80s is where it really seemed to take off. Uh, I think they exist in the '70s. I don't fully know the history, but I, I think that's where you start to see something, and then. I guess before that they had screw machines where it was like a mechanical computer, but yeah. Yeah, that was a real bear to reprogram. And then or just the like they would have mechanical guides, right? You could basically have an operator just slide it around in a jig that had preset like uh, holes or or stops where it would freeze, and then he can use that as a as a as a as a guide to know when to drill the next hole and snap it into the next you know thing and drill the hole and kind of like as, as a bet you when that came out that was a monumental increase in productivity. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah i can imagine yeah think about that yeah i mean surface and, uh, mount versus through hole i gotta <laughs> i gotta educate myself a little better i've never actually personally assembled a surface mount board embarrassingly um it, it's a whole different set of you know you know i i love circuit like circuit board technology and and I was actually really fortunate as, you know, as a hardware designer, my very first internship was actually at a PCB fabrication facility where they actually make the bare, you know, circuit boards without parts on it. That's awesome. And having that experience, you know, um, into as a designer is really, I, I love that the value of that. That's a mystery to me how those are made. So I'd be really interested it's, to get your insight on it. If you it's actually, it. believe it or not, the original, the old school methods are a lot like photography. In a lot of ways where they literally use the same a lot of the same terms in photography as you get with pcb fabrication where you literally have like a 
uh, um, oh my God, drawing a blank. What's what's the a neg like a negative, right? Okay. A negative. Yeah. For a photo, and you can have you basically have a negative of what a layer would look like, the artwork on a layer, and you can literally with um, photo sensitive material flash it with UV light. Oh, cool. And it cures the part that you want, or vice versa, it cures the part that you want to get rid of um, with respect to the image. And then the next step is to uh, develop it. So, so that's, that's the That's what they say? So you actually use the term like photo imaging, develop, and then the next process is called etch. Nice. Um, where, now that, that's like the one distinction from photography, but where you basically put it in a vat of acid and the parts that weren't cured get etched away and the parts that were get protected and they stay. And so, and then when you clean off that, and then the next step is cleaning and the next step after that, you are left with the traces that you want. So and how does that work with like, whole... oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean to cut you off. No, no go for it. I was gonna say, how does that work with a four layer board? And so what you do is then you can then, once you have your artwork, um, you can do multiple what they call lamination steps. Interesting. So you, you have, let's say you have a core where you can, and you can image, you can do that same process to both sides at the same time, right? So you can yeah. put it through machinery that does top and bottom at the same time. Um, and so you can do two layers at a time through your PCB fab. And then if you have holes, you put it through a CNC machine to do drilling. Nice. And then you got to plate those holes. So you do usually some kind of electrolysis to get copper to initially adhere to the bare laminate, which is like a fiberglass material. Um, and then you can plate that up to make it a better through hole. Um, and then if you have multiple layers, what you do is you go through a lamination process where you put a, an insulative material on each surface and then another layer of copper. And then you literally sandwich it on the heat and pressure oh, cool. get it to the thicknesses that you want. And then you can repeat that process of putting in a new image, developing it, nice. etching it cleaning it, re-drilling the holes where they need to be. It's actually really cool. Um, so you drill every thing. layer. That's interesting. Yeah, and so keep in mind, when I was a process intern at a company called Photo Circuits over in Glen Cove, New York, and Long Island, they were the ones, they had, they won a big contract at the time. They were doing the Pentium II. If, if oh, cool. I remember the Pentium II. The Pentium II was Intel's first attempt at making a modular, easily swappable processor, where it was the processor was actually on a card edge that you can install, just like a memory a, a dim socket. Like a yep. dim, you, know, you can go buy memory, you can pop in a dim slot and upgrade your memory. The Pentium 2 was the first processor that they allowed their end user to go out and buy a new processor. And you can just go pop it in to your, 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 your motherboard in a slot. And so this company I worked with, they had one of the big contracts from Intel because it actually sat on a circuit board. It oh, wasn't cool. just a, you know a, a piece of it wasn't just a chip. It was actually mounted on this circuit board with a card edge. And so so they so I got to experience you know what it took to make these you know high tech at the time uh, uh, circuit cards. And so a lot of the processes I was mentioning are kind of the old school where there was mechanical drilling, there was a lot of manual alignment there was literally a film for the negative that you would uv cure now technology has progressed to the point where a lot of it is actually done by laser <laughs> where it, where they it's so fast for them to actually like you can actually that, that actually laser drill now depending on the features interesting right? so like an old school board let me see if i have them i had a stack of like six pentium twos by the way at my uh parents basement in Ithaca, new york when i was a kid and so I really wonder if I have one of yours in there. <laughs> Look how cool would that be? There's, there's a chance. Um, like, you know, if you if you open up like any old electronics or cheap electronics, you'll probably have like a, just a two or a four or a six layer board in there. And a lot of times those probably use mechanical drills where they, they literally do a mechanical drill and then they have to plate that hole and then it's all a very manual process. But anything newer, like some of our like voxel computers that we sell on yeah. our website or our, our RB5 flight or um, we have a big upcoming announcement in April for our next evolution. Um, those are all laser drilled vias. Um, the holes are actually done by laser. Nice. And all the imaging is also done by laser because it's so fine. You know, you're talking about um, two mils, which is two thousandths of an inch wow. um, traces and, and two mil spacing, you know, whereas 
you know, circuit boards back in the day had like eight mil, eight mil lines, eight mil, eight mil gaps, you know, it's eight thousands of an inch, which still seems small for someone that's not familiar with the trade, but so you could fit four of those and, and one you know, of that, or sorry, four yeah, new boards. Yeah, back in the day, that's what, that's what these, you know, the cutting edge back in 2000 was maybe five, five, they called it, you know, five mil trace with a five mil gap. And the whole idea is that if you have too narrow of a gap adjacent trace, so two really, of those then, because it's two yeah, mil they, gap. If, if, if it wasn't processed correctly, those two traces could short out, right? And now you don't have two traces, you have one trace, which you don't want. Makes sense. And so you needed enough of a gap to prevent shorting between this acid etch, right? You, you would acid etch away the gap effectively. Um, and so you were limited by chemistry, chemical engineering, you know, how yeah. good of a feature you could get. But now with some of these these features are, you know, obviously they're not on the same scale as silicon ICs, you know, like you said, nanometer and, and, and stuff like that. Um, we're still in the thousands of an inch ballpark, but, you know, they do it with lasers so you can get like literally two mil trace, two mil space. We have some of our designs now that were even just under two mils for some of the trace widths and, and right around two mils for the trace space. You know, it's crazy what we what's That's awesome. what can be done now. And yeah, and a lot of that stuff's actually done by laser, which is crazy to think that they just, you know, they laser etch, they laser, laser drill, um, they do laser alignment, like it, like the alignment is verified with lasers. Oh, cool. Um, Cause you know, you have a board like this, this is, you know, our voxel and our box of flight, it's a 10 layer board, Nice. even though it look, it's only one millimeter thick, but there's actually 10 circuit layers in there. That's awesome. Um, think about you go, you know, you do the first inner layers, you do the next outer layer lamination process, then you do the next one. And what if you screw up on there's the so much that could go wrong yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like you you have to get every step is that much more important because if you scrap it your material waste is much higher and now you've lost how many weeks in fab you know it's like that's brutal usually each usually each lamination process as they call it usually takes a week for standard oh i did not know that that's that's a lot of time yeah so if you want an eight layer pcb normally that would take like three to four weeks because you start with your first two then you build up you build up um, for, for a sequential lamination process, what they call it, where you have to build up. There are some boards where you can literally take, um, multiple cores, let's say, and do them completely in parallel. And then just at the final step, laminate them together. Oh, cool. Um, but that's usually not for the higher density stuff. That's kind of more, you might see that in some more of the old school, you know, rugged and industrial style. Is that because it's um, susceptible to alignment issues if you don't get it exactly right? It's yeah, it's the it's 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 the alignment issues, it's the size of your holes, um, it's the trace the space requirements, it's the material choices you use, it's how you need to have your stack up. Um, it's the thickness of the dielectrics between the copper layers that can determine that as well. There's all these there's so many different variables. That's cool in, that they're called the dielectrics, like a capacitor. That's that makes sense given what it is. It's exactly the same material. It's it's you have you know, you have copper layer and a copper layer, you, you can't have them touch each other. Yep. So you need some type of material between them. Um, typically, you know, most commonly, you know, the circuit boards are what we we anecdotally call it FR4. That's what um, I've heard. It's, it's, it's like a fiberglass laminate. Um, but there's there's so many trade names and so many companies out there that make the stuff. And, and there's even like high speed dielectrics, high voltage dielectrics, you know, standard dielectric, high temperature dielectric. How I, high you know, can the voltage? Well, probably like, pretty damn high, I would assume. Well, not that high though, because you've got a gap somewhere. I mean, with like some vias or something. Yeah, one of our um, contractors that helped us with some designs, he's done some high voltage stuff before, where you're talking like you know four, five, six, seven hundred volts type stuff, and that's it's a whole different set of constraints to to worry about with your your PCB because it probably wants to arc. Exactly, you gotta you gotta you gotta have enough distance and enough high enough of a dielectric constant to prevent that from from arcing. That's awesome. Um, well, it's funny because I know it's, a dude. It is where... kind of cool how much stuff goes in there. I totally agree. That's that's awesome. I I know a guy that's in power electronics where he refers to six hundred volts as medium voltage. It's... <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. And yeah, yeah that's like for... like transmission line type stuff. I mean, that's a, yeah. For, by his standard, I, I don't know how many thousands of volts denotes what he would consider high voltage. That's kind of funny. Well, so formally, there's actually. Um... This is one of the things I'm actually been training some of the uh, younger engineers in my company. And I warned them, do not bring anything into the company that is over 50 volts because OSHA actually has a limit and it's 50.0. 
literally like so like if you were anything 50 volts and above is considered high voltage and that company has to go through like employee training certain levels of insurance certain levels of certification certain handling <laughs> plans it's more it's that it's that first threshold where you have to have so much uh, training and control process control like iso 9000 type you know process kind of like what you said you're hiring uh, someone on your team for like yeah. all that stuff starts to matter at 50 volts and so what's funny is that i've worked with companies where their highest voltage is 49.6 that's not by accident <laughs> <laughs> amazing and so we why not just a, 48 though I mean, it's a multiple of 12 i guess because you get a little bit more yeah you yeah. want you want as much obviously the higher voltage you operate at the lower current you can have. Right. so if you're trying to if you're trying to transfer voltage from one place to the to another you're best having as high voltage as possible that so makes you sense. Can have as little loss as well, possible. if you're going a long way you might get down to 48 or lower so. yeah but your your losses and cables are due to current not voltage oh and so if you have the higher voltage you can have less current and still deliver that same power because for your uninformed uh, listeners uh, power is voltage times current um, and so if you to keep the same power you can either increase voltage and decrease current or vice versa right yep um, so a lot of power engineers, if, if they want to keep the current down, they can increase the voltage and still deliver the same. Power. Well, also you can save on copper, which is quite expensive too. So if you don't exactly. want to run. If, if you, especially in, you know, any kind of vehicular based application or flight based application, weight is stuff you have to overcome, right? You have yeah. to overcome weight. Well, we're spending hundreds so, of thousands of dollars on cable in our factory right now. <laughs> major expense yeah, so if you can use a smaller gauge wire or you know let anything like that so it it, it is desirable you see a lot of engineering applications that they, they try to use high voltage as possible but i warned some of the new guys in my company they were talking to a customer over one of our forums and they were looking at doing um what they call 12 s and an s in in robotics battery domain lingo is a cell single cell and so a single battery, so like your phone, everyone's phone out there right now is 1S. And what a 1S battery is, is nominally it's at 3.7 volts and it ranges from 3.2 to 4.2. And so the range of a 1S battery is 3.2 volts to 4.2 volts. When you have, let's say a 2S, it adds it in series. And so the voltages add and when you're doing series. So a 2S battery is instead of 3.7, you're 6.4. Oh, and, and the range in the range scales, and you still have that one volt range on the top end. So, like a two S would be, you know, uh, five point uh, nine to uh, seven point uh, one or something like that. And so you keep going up, and so you know, three S, four S, five S, etc. So a lot of drones out there in the market. Some of these kind of like DJI, you know, consumer level grade drones that are you know on the order of you know less than a foot wide, let's say. Those are mostly two S, three S, four S drones, like in the hobbyist community. You'll see that level. Um, and so we had some inquiries into 12S and I had to uh, train my team. I'm like, listen, guys, 12S fully charged is above 50 volts. What's well, 4.2 not... times 12, right? Fully charged. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. when it's fully, yeah, when it's fully charged. And so I think it's like 50.4 or something like that. Oh, brutal. OSHA doesn't discriminate. It's above 50. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told, and I, and I had it, and I had to like, I had to like tag all the powers that be in my company. And I had to say, do not bring anything 12S in this company, in this building, because like our company can get sued if there's a problem. I mean, it, it can destroy us because it's like, there's so much level of, of, of training and safety protocols and things that need to be uh, understood in order to deal with, you know, 50 volts or higher from an OSHA standpoint. And so for me, when I, when I, I hear, I think of high voltage is 50 volts. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny to, to you know you said your friend is 600 volts is medium voltage i guarantee you that guy probably took no less than 10 hours of training classes <laughs> <laughs> oh for sure more than that i think he's got a whole bunch of them yeah i mean he's got stories too like um he told me you could use a you know there's holding brakes on industrial systems so uh um, like a motor shaft that spins with like industrial automation component you see these in robot arms like an abb or a fanic arm if power cuts you have a brake that has a solenoid that normally holds the brake calipers open but if power goes away they shut and you freeze that that joint or that that axis of rotation so it tries to fail safe 
basically that, that's that's like a fail safe yeah yeah that's the idea behind where a holding if, break if there's failure it tries to go into a safe mode yeah exactly so the idea is you don't have your robot arm go limp and you know crush somebody or or inertia right, right. keeps it spinning around and it goes out of control or whatever so my my friend the same guy was telling me about uh because he's done a lot of industrial automation using one of those as an emergency dynamic break <laughs> and so the difference between a holding break and a dynamic break is that a holding break is not designed, I don't know if it's actually a disc break like I was describing, but it's not designed to stop at um, at speed. It's like the parking pin in your car. It's just designed to go in when the thing's already stopped and, and keep it stopped. So he was saying that if you use one of those as an emergency dynamic break, it'll start smoking, it might catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he said he's seen it twice and, it, and both times it caught fire but it stopped you know the thing from moving in, in an emergency and so that's you know another thing that's kind of funny from an industrial accident perspective funny is by the wrong word kind of interesting <laughs> from an industrial accident perspective is um you know we, you know, we as engineers we we, we have a, a different sense of what it means to be funny <laughs> um yeah somebody had to correct me so i was around some relatives and um the one guy goes, he means peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or interesting. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> or unexpected. <laughs> Absolutely. It's another interesting one is in the CNC world, you can do centralized chip conveyance systems, which I've been looking at recently for work. So you can have like, you can send, um, so chips are like the bits of metal that come off your big chunk you're turning into a little chunk so when you you take your end mill and you spin it around and you knock all these chips off they build like up sawdust but metal that's exactly it so it's it's metal okay. sawdust and so when your sawdust builds up eventually it's going to jam up your machine because i mean we start Actually. with a hundred pound piece we end with a 10 pound piece because we're making parts for satellites and moon yeah, rovers get... and rockets and so it's all weight reduction and, and ribbing and yanking out material and so um, basically, you know, we, we have a lot of chips, like we're, you know, we're generating 90 pounds of chips when we start with that hundred pound piece and end up with that 10 pound piece. And so um, really, really quickly. You guys actually, so you reclaim that and try to build it back into a, another, like you recycle it, so to speak? Or you can, you can do that. So when, when I was at SpaceX, their machine shop did that for titanium. You can increase your margins by like around 5% by doing that, uh, I think. Don't don't quote me on that. But um, yeah, you can. So you, you can briquette to get better density and it goes into a um, smelting process better because it's all dense and, and packed together like, like a charcoal briquette going into a grill. Um, you can, people will send like full tractor trailers full of chips right to the scrapyard and just sell the truck. So you've got these chip conveyance systems and we're currently using conveyor belts. And what happens is under the machine, the conveyor belt runs, it goes up a little track and then it, it spits out these chips. And this is like a $14,000 per machine system. And it goes into a bin and then those bins get wheeled off to recycling. And you know, that's, that's how it works. Um, but in bigger shops, like we'll say um, certain aerospace facilities, and um, certain automotive facilities, for instance, um, they'll get a whole bunch of um, pneumatic lines is one way to do it. So you, you have, um, there's a thing you use in CNC machining. I'm sorry if this gets a little bit drawn out, but it's called coolant. So you spray this um, water mixed with this uh, water-based liquid and it pulls chips away from your part and helps evacuate the part so that you don't have, you know, the works jammed up with bits of sawdust. And so it's, it's the same thing. You know, my dad has a vacuum based system in his workshop for the, yeah. for the wood sawdust, where it's like, a, and it can and it bring, you put vacuums. Oh, so then, you know, places. those systems can explode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, <laughs> they can because aerosolized sawdust yeah. in, in wood form, you know, if you introduce a spark, I mean, that's a great way to make yeah. a fireball. And the same yeah, is true yeah. of titanium. You know? and so, I, I was talking to a guy the other day who had installed a, a vacuum chip conveyance system in the titanium plant, and he saw a titanium explosion when this thing ignited. Wow. And I can only the imagine fireball goes down the line. It's pretty brutal. So. That's great. I didn't, so I didn't know titanium itself was actually combustible. 
Do you watch, um, did you ever watch Dexter? I think it's a Class D fire, um, but I, I, I'm a little bit green on the subject, so. Like so, so I'm, I'm doing one of my usual, like, random. I haven't um, watched Dexter yet. I would like to. Associations to a conversation. No, this I'm is perfect. That, this right? is what I, I, I like, like having, having this a conversation kind of on one thing and completely tangent and thinking something else. Have you seen the new season that came out? Not yet. The first Blood. Oh, my goodness. You got to watch it, number one. I, uh, I, you can do can it. Can right I watch now. it out of sequence? Like, if I watch that before the rest of them, would it make sense? If you haven't seen Dexter, the original, you're going to miss a lot of... You know, okay, so you, start you with the first you, one. Yeah, so for any of your fans that haven't watched Dexter, I recommend go watch the original series first from Showtime before you watch the New Blood season. Um, but what you can do, and what we did, and uh, I don't care if I'm called a cheapskate, <laughs> you can go right now. Uh, Showtime has this thing with Amazon where if you watch through Amazon TV... You can subscribe to Showtime for like 99 cents for a month for two months. Like you can do like 99 cents for the first two months. That's awesome. And it's only 10 episodes or whatever. So that's a month is more than enough to watch, you know, 10 episode, you know, series. Oh, for sure. Even, with, even my wife and I with a kid, we were still able to get in like an episode a night at the end of the night. And that's awesome. And the reason why I brought that up, you're like, what the hell does this have to do with anything you're talking about? Uh, create ways You'll, to kill a person. When you do watch it, you're going to remember this now. And, and this may be months in the future, but you're going to remember, and even your listeners, there's a key thing in this series that revolves around titanium. <laughs> I don't want to give away any spoilers. Um, but one of the one of the premises about the titanium is that it doesn't melt. And so to me, like, no, now that I don't know anything. I'm not a materials engineer. I don't know material science. Um, I would assume it melts you if you get it hot enough, a, but I don't know. Like, I'm not a metallurgist. So. But, well, okay, I'll have to give away some of the, some of the thing that in a typical fire let's say that probably you know, maybe not like in a you know maybe like not like a smelting pro whatever obviously you need to form titanium at a certain temperature but in a typical you know what a, what a person would go through in a normal life in terms of how you know fires and and things of that nature like a house fire or something like that let's say interesting you know, like titanium wouldn't melt in those kinds of conditions um and so for you to say that you have a titanium explosion is kind of like well how does that work it's like i'm trying to like Parse well, the one from what I've heard, and, and I'm still researching this, so you know, maybe you don't take me at face value, but verify. Uh, but it's it creates a class D fire, which is you can't extinguish it with like a non class D fire extinguisher because it's a self perpetuate, it's like magnesium fire. Where, like, you remember in World oh. War II, like they wouldn't weld magnesium, they would rivet it because if they were to weld it, it would ignite and you'd never be able to put it out. Like, so it's like that, but I think to like a slightly lesser extent than magnesium. Gotcha. That's interesting. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, it's like uh, I think the white in fireworks is magnesium. It could be titanium, actually, because when we did battle bots, well, magnesium makes sense too. Magnesium also burns white. Mm -hmm. But when we did battle bots, if you would hit a titanium armor plate, it would it would make white sparks. Oh, interesting. So so maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I'm not. I'm not a materials guy, so I just. I'm not either. That's why I'm hiring people. <laughs> so it's, my yeah, it's kind of cool, and, and it's good. And I love you know, you know, to all you young engineers listening, you know, always take your lack of knowledge as an opportunity to explore it and learn it. Um, Amen to that. I'm going to refer back to our first podcast we did, where I mentioned um, my wife and I at the time were watching a lot of the trivia game shows, like The Chase, and just anything with, with respect to trivia, and it's just it's that one show, The Chase, is back on again. We're watching it again. And it's just amazing. It's kind of like former contestants from Jeopardy are like the the leads of this show. And it's just amazing the knowledge that these guys have. So random. Oh, like, for you know, sure. Just, just the most random bits of knowledge that these guys have. And one of them had said that what he does is that, you know, the moment he encounters anything he's never heard of, he makes it a point to just write it down. And then when he's got a chance to just go, you know, Google it and, and look it up and explore what what that is and it's like man i wish i had that time i admire that <laughs> i mean it's i, like I feel like when just, i was in it's, school it's that... sorry say again yeah no i was just saying i just it's amazing i i give credit to the, to those that mentality of someone that can take their lack of knowledge as a um as a mechanism to to perpetuate their own knowledge like admitting your own deficiencies and saying i want to go fix that that's so, awesome like in your case, you're 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 interviewing chemical engineers. How do you challenge them 
with an interview questionnaire, right? Very difficult. I'm relying pretty much. You don't even know if they're bullshitting you. I'm relying almost (laughs) exclusively (laughs) on uh, on referrals. And then, I mean, my my whole team right now for that project consists of one PhD student in chemistry. It's it's a little bit uh, bottlenecking to say the least. Because you can't you can't accomplish very much with a student. Um, he's great. He, he's he's awesome. He knows way more than me about chemistry. Um, but I need to I need to get a better a yeah. bigger team. I should say one of my uh, more seasoned. One of my old managers at Qualcomm, I said like I will will never hire a PhD. He's like even if it's for a research role. He's like I will never hire a PhD just because you know he's been so I guess you know he was fifty. This is going back ten years. So he was, I think, exposed a lot to, you know, the 80s and 90s heyday of PhDs where they literally just spent years in the lab or writing papers and never got anything done and they still got paid. <laughs> you put that kind of mentality into a high tech industry, like a startup or, or like, a, you know, like a, or a Qualcomm. And it's like, okay, you still need to actually do something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so for like, sure. <laughs> well, I, I told a guy today, I was interviewing a PhD student, um, you know, just because I was kind of in a wide net. I interviewed somebody with 30 years experience in surface chemistry, and then I interviewed a PhD student that was about to graduate, I did a bunch of other people. But and then I interviewed another guy that had, um, you know, people have those, uh, those maze with the, like the line with how good they are at different things, and they got a bunch of things in the chart. So this guy had like a like a 10 out of 10 for lasers. <laughs> and then he had he had um, terminal ballistics listed as a skill, <laughs> so, and he was a sergeant so of the Israeli language. army. He was a badass. <laughs> like, yeah. He like loved R and D. He was super cool. Um, but then the PhD so student said something. He'd be a good friend to have if you need to go uh, do some precision rifle shooting. <laughs> oh, for sure. Or if I need to survive an apocalypse. <laughs> but like <Yeah. laughs> this guy. <laughs> Uh, this other this other guy um, was saying something like, "I'm like, so what would you expect to get paid in this role? Because that's for me a standard interview question. I like to get out of the way, just to sort of you know front load, and um, which not necessarily what everyone does, but I, I like that approach. Uh, I enjoy negotiations, and so he goes, "Well, standard range for somebody with a PhD." I was like, "I don't give a rat's ass what your education is. <laughs> you know, like I'll hire a guy." with no high school diploma over a guy with a PhD if he gets results. <laughs> so, I should say yeah, I'll hire 100%. a person if he or she gets results, but you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, no, 100%, I totally agree with you. And, and yeah, it should be based on you know, what you can do. Again, I was just talking to my wife the other day about how I love my job right now so much, more than any other job, just due to the, the flexibility of working from home and you know, I guess, like I, I mentioned before our podcast, I got to cut it at 5.30 my time because, um, you know, we still have, you know, toddler, son, he's no going to be 22 months next week. And, uh, you know, he's on a pretty strict schedule. And if, you know, as when your parents know, you don't want to interrupt their schedules. And so, um, anyway, the point that I was, I was going to make is that um, working where I work, if I don't have those key, you know, certain hours where I can't work, that's fine as long as I get the job done, right? And I think that's an important skill, especially today with a lot of people wanting to work remote. It's going to be, it's more important to show that you can deliver and get stuff done more so than just FaceTime or hours or or whatever it is. It's about, you know, can you meet what you need to do? I think that's a positive change. I've been noticing that too. It's a little bit weird at times because I think people need to have symbols. (laughs) So I've noticed that like, an older guy, I was surprised he told me this, but he was mentioning that like it seems like a suit makes you look like a schmuck nowadays. And it's like, oh, I like wearing a suit every now and then, but like, you know, I don't want to look like an asshole, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it at home. But it's it's kind of silly. Like, it, it shouldn't matter if you're wearing a suit or, or a hoodie or a t shirt or, you know, a bow tie if you know what you're doing, you know, and, and you can get yeah. results. Like, or most of my days, I still, you know, rock a base. Baseball hat. I'm from home, and it's like, but I I deliver. Yeah. And well, I guess football hat technically my team, even though they they sucked that last game. I'm still rooting for my team. All good. Um. Uh, that's a true fan. Even though I'm a new fan, I'm a true fan. I'm. I know they sucked. They played terribly. It was embarrassing, but still gonna root for them. You know, there's a lot to be said for consistency, and I, I respect that. That's <laughs> like, I'm a Patriots fan. Years. I'm a Steelers fan. <laughs> yeah. I guess I think I mentioned on the first podcast that the only reason why I'm a Cowboys fan is because I was a hard I'm always into like I believe in being a home team fan. And when I moved to San Diego, I didn't follow football, I was baseball. 
and it was impossible for me to become a Padres fan. It was just, it just didn't work. So I became <laughs> a Chargers fan and I was such a hardcore Chargers fan, such a team player, you know, home team guy. And then when they moved to LA, I was crushed and I'm Brutal. like, screw that. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to root for someone that won't let me down in terms of, you know, their relationship to their fans. Yeah. And makes like, sense. Well, Cowboys have been known as America's team. Um, they're still the most valuable uh, franchise brand in all sports, excluding, I think, one or two uh, soccer teams in the world. Um, more so than the Yankees, they, they have a more valuable brand. So I'm like, well, I guess they would never let me know. I'll root for the Cowboys. H- hence why I actually ended up going to Texas, believe it or not, was because of the Chargers leaving California. Anyway, I'm mumbling again. No, no, it's all good. I, I like and, these And I'm repeating well. myself on the first podcast. Nothing wrong with that. Um, my, my whole point getting back to it is that you know, I haven't had a proper haircut in probably two years, and you know, it doesn't impact. <laughs> I haven't my had hair in like on. seven years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I still we we kick ass as a small company and a startup. We're getting you know more repeat business and and more work. And uh, like I mentioned to you before, you start recording. We're just super busy because we do a great job, and it's you know my whole team and everyone. You know, a lot of us work remote, and we just get get shit done. That's awesome. And uh, it's important to just have that flexibility, which plays into that whole. Early question I mentioned is that we're now looking for a new hire. And I can't imagine as a new hire, as an EE, starting off at a company that we're, you know, a, lo- a large percentage of the workforce is usually working from home a lot of time. And so, you know, we're going to be interviewing candidates soon for, for a new hardware engineering role. And it's really going to challenge, I think, my ability as a mentor as well. I've always loved being like the mentor to a new. I hire. like that one as well. I mean, I was mentored amazingly well by my first boss at, at well, again, now Microchip. And to the point where I, I think I, I still kind of like have a special place in my in my professional career and heart for him because the way he mentored me was so, it was really, you know, he took his time, he did the right thing, and I learned a lot from him. Um, and so to, I try to keep paying that forward to, to the future generations of engineers. And part of me is, you know, how am I going to do that with, until this pandemic officially goes away because in california we still have the mask orders uh, you know, for indoor places i shouldn't say have, that you know, but i mean it's it's pretty brutal i mean i don't know it, it, it strikes it, me as i don't want to get into politics <laughs> it's, it's silly yeah, no, politics, yeah, same, here, same here and we deal with it every day enough right it's like to, this yeah. is this is an outlet for people and for people to come watch your show and, and yeah. listen to us babble on for a couple hours of, over bullshit but you're right there's going to be said to set for a face-to-face interaction and so like, that's, yeah. that's not, well, especially when it comes to like a physical process, you know, yeah. or, or just understanding something, yeah. I do feel like you can accomplish a lot with these kind of video meetings. I mean, I've never met you face to face yet, but this is kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is interesting how, you know, I learned, especially when I started working in circuit, yeah, circuit board technology in the late nineties. Um, sorry, I, I, I was fidgeting with my circuit boards here. Um, no, it's great props. I'm glad you brought I was still getting like big plots of the artwork and like here like, I have like a, a notepad and like I would like flip the pages that represent the layers and kind of look at them on top of each other and kind of like try to hold them up to the light table and try to see, you know, how oh. the artwork flows through. Like there wasn't, you know, the CAD tools weren't sophisticated enough really when I first started to review That's them. That's an old lawyer tool or they trick were, actually. Or they were super expensive to, to get the CAD tools, you know, so we, you know, we hired a contractor and they had the CAD tool. Nice. And, you know, we can drive the schematic to review the CAD, the layout. We would, like, look at it on a light table and hold sheets over each other. And so that was clear. Like I said, my mentor at the time, he showed me how to do that. And it, the only way to do that is him sitting right next to me. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, and he showed me how he did it. Like, there's no alternative to that. Well, and think now, about it from a technician's it's... perspective, even more than an engineer. I mean, right. if you're trying to do physical harnessing or machine tool operation or... Yeah, and uh, stuff every moment. Yeah. Yeah, there's no way to do that remotely, unfortunately. And so you just you just can't. And you gotta be there. It's it's an interesting kind of continuum. Yeah, I think definitely like electrical and mechanical designers um are more of the hands-on type skill where you appreciate I guess machine tool operator is the exception because of what form logic's doing. Yeah. But other than that, I mean I keep perpetually <laughs> on my desk is like my most common circuit boards that I work with in terms of, you know, talking to my software engineers about, I keep like a ruler. Oh, I have that ruler too. I like that one. (laughs) You know, I just, I just, I'm always, I always have like my gadgets and gizmos right here, ready to go. And so, so I I can fidget with them often. (laughs) I had, I had some of our guys tell me that they were learning from me the other day and it made me so happy 
like like we've got this one guy that's an army veteran and he's um he's basically a maintenance engineer he's like Spencer, i've learned so much from you since you came to form logic i'm really great and i'm like thank you <laughs> i appreciate that sam good guy yeah yeah yes yeah, so i'm a little cautious about you know you know for since we've started our hardware team was just myself and my manager and it's just been us two and we were ex seasoned experienced i mean between the two of us probably over 50 years of circuit design experience and now this is going to be our first new hire for a new grad in ee and i'm like man i you know this is going to be an interesting little challenge to take someone that is you know very little experience and really get them to where we need to be how many candidates you look at remote application so it's going to challenge my mentor management leadership capabilities so it's gonna be interesting it should be fun well so I, I i had a project that sounds like a lot of fun i had a project over the vid um so this was 2020 where we did um it was all software which is not my sport admittedly but i had the benefit of really good managers and engineers and so i don't want to say the team ran itself because it didn't i mean i i, I didn't sleep very much while that project was ongoing but I mean, the team was was exemplary, and I was really grateful for that. Um, and it was all remote, the entire bit of work, uh, but it's software, so it's a little different, I feel like. But it was software for a robot, but it was a robot that didn't exist yet. And so one of the tasks we had to do was build a simulation tool for the robot, which was really cool. And we had to kind of develop our own set of tools to develop this remotely. So that was kind of a neat, different challenge. Um, one thing I find that helps a lot is having duplicate sets of hardware for anything like that. So mm -hmm. like enough that everybody gets at least one. Um, so like any peripheral that interfaces to the system, any tool that you need, any bit from the system to make a copy for every single remote worker, I think is, is critical. Well, um, I know you've made a lot of military references and past podcasts and a lot of, you know, some of your military, uh, former military colleagues, and we sure. talked about that a lot. And you've probably heard of the rule of twos in military. I now. haven't actually. Uh, so the rule, the rule, uh, excuse my, my accent's coming out a little bit when I drink. The okay. rule of twos is that two is one, one is none. Um, and it applies definitely when it comes to hardware, where if, you know, say you have a very urgent or a very important customer deliverable and they're expecting to get you know, a unit, you know, you want to make sure you build more than one. Oh, fuck. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you got to account for a failure. You got to account for something breaking or falling yeah. out because you want to make sure you have that backup ready to go. And yeah, exactly. Or even three. <laughs> <laughs> and so the rule of twos is that, yeah, always expect, always plan for something breaking, right? Always plan for something to be broken or, or, or to break. Um, if, if it's not broke now, it will break. For sure. And so you basically need to make sure you have that golden setup. And one of the, and going back to like my early mentor, one of the things that he taught me was um, what made me a good debugger. Like something goes wrong, I need to debug, debug hardware, try to figure out what's wrong, is always revert back to your golden setup. If you suspect, if you can't figure out what's happening, why something's wrong, revert back to your golden setup. You should always have a golden well, setup. Well, you use a you golden setup coming. in electrical as well? Absolutely. I've heard that in automotive. We talked about that today in manufacturing, golden parts. I've heard golden engine from engineers at General Motors. This is interesting. <laughs> okay, so what is a golden well, setup in your field? Sure, um, especially in, in a company like Qualcomm, where they would introduce software builds every couple of weeks. Not only did we have golden hardware, I forced them to issue a golden software release to us, where we had a snapshot in time where we knew that that software build worked perfectly with this particular version of hardware. Nice. And it would be basically a snapshot in time that we would call golden. And then as you bring out new software or new hardware, if you ever experience a problem, you can always revert back to that golden setup to kind of start your debug again from scratch or to help you figure out. And if it, it to, you know, the whole still doesn't work in the golden variable. setup, then it's probably a hardware issue and not a software issue. Is the yeah, it's, it's the same that. principle of multivariable analytics, right? Yeah. If you can isolate one variable at a time to figure out where your problems are, that's how you're going to solve it, right? Isolate one variable at a time. And so what a golden setup would do is help you isolate one variable at a time. 
okay, let's keep the hardware the same. Let's increment the software or nice. keep the software the same, increment the hardware. It's kind of like one or the other, right? That's clever. And that would help you figure out what's wrong or, or maybe the cable harness is, is busted or maybe the power supply is, is busted. And so I always wanted to start off whenever I was interviewing uh, test engineers at Qualcomm that will come work with our program. I would always tell them right away, where's your golden setup going to live? Like, <laughs> like, where's your bench for your golden setup? Like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you need to have a golden setup, right? What if, you know, how are you going to debug? And, it's like, <laughs> and some of them got it. Like one of my good buddies, Rob, um, that I work with at Qualcomm, uh, he was my best man at my wedding. Nice. Um, he was all about that. You know, we had a lot of fun trips to China and we would make sure that the, you know, and our teams in China would have golden setups. Um, so yeah, it, we definitely use it in hardware a lot. It's, it's important. Like, and, and for anyone that needs to de do a debug, I mean, you got to have a golden setup. So a golden setup, uh, for those listening, I'm going to guess, because I don't know either. I, I think it's in, I, I know in terms of a uh, mechanical thing, it's like, it's like a perfect part. It's like the best you can get it. Everything is a material certification sheet. Everything is traceable. Everything is, you know, as good as you can get. And engines, I think it's the same thing. Everything is a material search sheet. Everything's been machined to a higher tolerance than the final thing. It's an ideal part. What does it mean in terms of board fabrication? Or, or For test us, it's more about testing. Okay. I use it in terms of testing and debug. Um, it doesn't necessarily represent that it's a higher quality of part or a higher quality system. It represents a known working variable. Okay. So most particularly useful for debug validation and test so that as you're introducing new components to your system, whether it be new hardware or software updates, if something breaks or something's not working the way you expect it, you can revert back to that. And you validate that working. through testing, I'm assuming. Yeah. So say you have, um, there's a new thing in software now called CI or continuous integration where they will as software engineers put out new software builds every night, let's say they can test nightly. Yeah. And you want to run that on what's called, you would want to run that on a golden setup, but you know, known good working piece of hardware, known good backed up for software where you can always revert back to a known good platform that you know is going to work. Yeah. So if you introduce a new build and it fails, okay, let's revert back to the old build. Does it work? And if it does work now, you know, your issue is with the software and not the hardware. But if, not the hardware. And so it's just a, so I so we use it in in hardware world as a as a, a colloquialism to refer to a known good setup. Okay, that makes sense. You know, the hardware is good. Your test equipment's good. Your software is. So good. it sounds like the same yeah. thing. Yeah, but it's not. Nece it doesn't necessarily need to be um, the most pristine version. Like I said, it doesn't represent in the case of like you said, like with an engine or in a manufacturing part, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's got the best tolerances of build it just means it works we know it works how do you validate that though because i feel like there's always edge cases there's always something that's going to catch you off guard it's, it's the chicken egg scenario right yeah. when, when you have a brand new piece of hardware say you say you have a brand new program brand new project and you have brand new hardware and brand new software right how do you get to that golden setup yeah it's definitely the hardware software engineer interaction getting to a an agreement of what's considered working Got it. Right. It's you got to take that risk. You got to take that leap, and it's those things where if you're just trying to get the thing to boot and it's not booting, well, okay, is it the hardware? Is it the software? That makes sense. And you, you run it through a battery of tests, and it passes, and you're like, okay, that's considered golden. Exactly. And yeah, you can modify your definition of what it means to be a golden setup, right? Obviously, if you're a brand new project, brand new team, and let's say you're doing a drone, maybe a golden setup is just something that spins motors. Okay. And then. As you incorporate more and more software, now you have, let's say you have cameras coming in, you have different sensor data coming in. You, know, you can modify what it means to be a golden setup as long as you know that whatever you claim is a golden setup, is it, it works to some level of specification that you know of. So that as you introduce new stuff, you can always revert back to it to use your help to help you debug, whether it be hardware or software. Cool. Um, so it's definitely, it's a living term. It's, it's a, no, it's not a static term. It, it means something different to everybody. Usually it's just, okay, this, this board has been proven golden with this software release. And I know if, you know, they try to load new software and it fails, well, it's not the hardware. So yeah. Was, you know, vice versa. No, that makes sense. And I'm sure the reason that we consider a golden part to be one with material search sheets that's passed 
all these different, you know, inspections. I mean, and that's what you benchmark the other parts against is, is just because that's the best we can do in terms of QA. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're in a high volume manufacturing test facility, like a Foxconn that builds Apple parts or something of that nature, you, know, you want to start your day off with your golden setup to say, okay, I know this iPhone 13 on this test station and this equipment passes so that when you get your next iPhone that you got to test, you know that it's being tested on a valid test station, right? Yeah, it's the it's iPhone and not the, the test it's, hardware. Yeah, it's it's that whole concept of garbage in, garbage out, right? If you are if you have a garbage test station and it says that your equipment passes when it really didn't, <laughs> so that doesn't help you. <laughs> you need so it's kind of it's kind of like a validating everything It's validating your test setup It's validating your software It's validating your hardware so if you change any one variable and you run it again and everything works you know that that's good so, so it's kind of usually like i said in, in a high volume manufacturing environment let's say you're testing millions of iphones i can assure you pretty much every day those test operators would start with their golden setup make sure their known good reference works before they start testing the thousands more that they got to test that day. Yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of the same concept. Awesome. All right, well, it's getting two minutes to when you got to go. So yeah, I got to get I got to get going soon. Is there anything you yeah, want to plug? So, Do you want to talk more about that JD and and we can post it or like what what's what's a good thing? So to yeah, talk definitely. About? Um, I'm really really excited about what Moto AI is going to announce at the AUVSI Exponential 2022 conference coming up in April. Ooh, Florida. we've done that expo. That's cool. I, I, and this this podcast will probably air right around then. I'm, I'm guessing, um, or sometime you know within a couple of weeks of that. And so, I think when I was last on, I, I touted our RB5 flight announcement from with Qualcomm, our, our our working with Qualcomm. And so I appreciate you giving me another opportunity here to tout that. We're not saying what it is yet. But Moto AI is going to have a new big announcement that we're going to announce at the AUVSI. Obviously, Expo. check it out. <laughs> and uh, we know it's going to basically be um, the world's best, smartest, smallest, most powerful flight controller, um, indisputably. That's and, awesome. Uh, we're really excited about it. We're going to be well positioned with that product. It's something that I've been working on for over a year. Nice. I've never really have only been able to say to select a few of our early access partners on their NDA. Um, and it's something that we know is going to drive our company to a whole new level of, of growth. And so we're really, really excited about it. Um, I actually kind of did a, uh, a two second sneak peek of the board related to it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to edit that out or can we keep it? No, no, keep it. No one's going to know. Okay, cool. <laughs> no <one laughs> well, you've know. said it now. But... <laughs> yeah. If they can find out, I mean, they, it's, it's, it's just, it's really, it's, it's freaking bitching. All right. um, and it's something that I'm so proud of, you know, it was a huge hardware effort for us uh, at our company um, to think that, uh, you know, a small company like us would take that level of investment. Um, I really appreciate that our CEO, Chad Sweet, um, knows, and his, he uses this term all the time. Hardware is hard to do as, <laughs> as, 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 a, as a company, and especially as a startup, it's, it's hard to succeed being a hardware company or someone that sells hardware you know a lot of these companies out there these billion dollar unicorns that all they do is make software i mean that's a whole another it's a whole, just a whole different level when you have to actually produce a product for sure physical tangible product i completely agree my brother has a hard software company him and i argue about this all the time <laughs> but i mean you just don't need to have product inventory you don't have any yeah. inventory problems or challenges when you're doing all software yep. there's no such thing as inventory you just click release. I mean, I'm not trying to trivialize the episode. No, 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 I, but it's easy to say, you know, it isn't if you haven't done it. And so I, I completely agree. Yeah, I'm not saying one's easier or harder. I'm not saying that one's necessarily easier. It, they're, it, it's a different set of challenges. Sure. When, you, when you're trying to sell a tangible product yep. compared to offering a software release. Um, not to say one's easier or harder than another, but even our CEO, who is a was a director of software engineering at Qualcomm, and he's a software genius, even he says hardware is hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's a heavy investment up front that can take many, many months or quarters or well, even years. Well, on an ongoing basis back. too. I mean, you, you never have to stop producing inventory. I mean, you're constantly doing that. Uh, there's new challenges, things can break. I mean, you can have something go wrong with a factory with your inventory. I mean, there's so many, th supply chain can can mess things up. I mean, yeah. There's a lot and of challenges. Like I showed there. you, 
on a circuit board, I mean, you have literally hundreds and hundreds of components on a circuit board that you need to pay for before you can sell it. You need to pay for the circuit board. You need to pay for that process and you need to pay for that testing. You need to pay software engineers to develop software for it. Um, and then hardware engineers as well before you can make a dime on product sales. And so it's a heavy investment up front for a hardware company. And so we're really, really proud of um, probably like a year and a half of investment so far by the time we announced this thing in April wow. of, of what we've been doing. Um, and so we're really, really excited about it. So stay tuned. Um, we're excited about it. So thank you for giving me that plug opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank that. you. Thank you for coming on. Um, and yeah, anything you want me to edit in, send over videos, anything, we'll get it in. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Appreciate it. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.